Hola, bona tarda a tothom. El meu nom és Marta Montalban i us volia donar la benvinguda a aquest debat que hem organitzat des de la Fundació Ciutat Invisible. Dir-vos que la Fundació Ciutat Invisible és una fundació impulsada per Vito Produccions l'any 2013. Vito Produccions és l'empresa que crea, organitza i gestiona el Festival Temporada Alta i que la creem amb diversos objectius, però fonamentalment ens plantejàvem un propòsit una mica modest, però alhora ambiciós, que és intentar establir punts de trobada entre diferents agents socials, econòmics, teixit empresarial, entre representants del món artístic, representants del món cultural, que d'alguna manera trobessin un punt de connexió on debatre i erigir-se d'alguna manera com una xarxa cultural que repensés determinats plantejaments que creiem que per nosaltres són importants. A partir d'aquí, nosaltres amb aquesta fundació comencem la nostra activitat. Hem creat un projecte que ja té tres anys que es diu A Tempo, Arts i Formació, en el qual contextualitzem aquesta jornada. A Tempo, Arts i Formació és un programa que precisament vam presentar en premsa el dimarts un petit balanç de tancament i només de titular dir-vos que l'any passat vam passar cap a 6.500 alumnes per aquest programa més de 650 docents i 90 representants del sector artístic i cultural. Dir que el tret de sortida de la campanya d'aquest any és aquest debat amb el senyor Enric Giroux, que en aquest debat seguirà l'organització d'un seminari que es durà a terme el mes de juliol, precisament aquí a la Mercè, un seminari dirigit a docents i professionals del món de la gestió cultural, i que és un seminari que organitzem conjuntament amb Conarte Internacional, que aquest any hem doblat les places degut a la demanda de l'any passat, que ens va deixar molta gent fora, per tant aquest any ofertem 100 places, i que esperem que sigui un èxit com l'han sigut les darreres dues edicions. D'aquest seminari se us ha donat una petita informació i els que ens heu facilitat el correu electrònic rebreu en els propers dies alguna informació complementària. Res més, agrair sobretot als col·laboradors de la Fundació que ens faran possible dur a terme activitats com aquesta que ens ocupa aquesta tarda, sobretot a la Fundació Banc de Sabadell, que és qui ens permet desenvolupar el projecte a Tempo i que segurament sense ell o no es faria o es podria fer d'una manera molt més diferent. Agrair així mateix a Conarte la col·laboració i la implicació en tots els projectes que portem des de ja fa alguns anyets i a la gent de la Mercè, del Centre Cultural de la Mercè, que ens acull amb les conferències, jornades i activitats que duem a terme dintre d'aquest programa. Espero que sigui del vostre interès i que ens veiem aviat. Fins a la propera. Molt breument... Jo soc l'Aida Sánchez de Sergio, que estaré d'alguna manera moderant la conversa amb Henry Giroux i la meva introducció serà també molt breu perquè la idea és que tinguem temps precisament de mantenir aquesta conversa. Per tant, faré només una petita introducció al sentit que creiem que té aquesta jornada i per altra banda us explicaré una miqueta la dinàmica que en principi en la difusió ja està explicada però per fer recordatori per si algú no la té present. Per començar amb el sentit de la jornada i a banda d'agrair la invitació de poder participar en aquesta conversa, que per mi és un luxe i un plaer també poder estar aquí amb tots vosaltres, crec que queda clar que l'interès que s'ha volgut posar i que es manifesta en aquest format és el de mantenir un diàleg més que el de tenir una actitud d'escolta d'una ponència. Per tant, és més la possibilitat de qüestionar, de preguntar, d'explorar noves possibilitats de quelcom que en Henry Giroux ha estat treballant al llarg de molts anys. Per tant, penso que aquesta possibilitat d'establir un diàleg és realment un plaer, és un luxe i que estarà molt bé que la puguem aprofitar. Crec que les pedagogies crítiques han sigut importants per totes aquelles persones que han estat interessades en impulsar formes transformadores de pedagogia, sobretot aquelles persones que han entès que l'educació forma part del debat polític més ampli, que és una part constituent del debat social, per tant és una figura coneguda, a més les pedagogies crítiques 
Crec que també és important entendre-les en plural, entendre que són tot un seguit de corrents que de vegades fins i tot poden tenir certes diferències entre si i que d'alguna manera també protagonitzen altres noms. Molts d'ells prendran com a referència a Paulo Freire com una de les figures inaugurals i a més a més de Henry Giroud també hauríem de tenir en compte gent com Aira Shore, Peter McLaren, John Kinchelow, Donaldo Macedo, Stephen Kemis... Michael Apple, però també és important entendre que hi ha també figures femenines en aquest treball que encara que s'identifiquin o es posin al pin de la pedagogia crítica o no i participen i l'han pres com a referent com Bell Hooks, Patty Lather o Claudia Corol des d'altres àmbits. També crec que l'interessant de la pedagogia crítica és que així com ha sigut un referent molt important, també ha sigut objecte, com és lògic i crec que com és productiu, de certes discussions des del punt de vista de la pròpia pràctica educativa, aquest debat entre les concepcions macro i estructurals i els debats sobre la pedagogia entesa com aquesta filosofia o teoria política i què passa amb les pràctiques, que hi ha hagut tot un debat també pel que fa amb el feminisme o el postestructuralisme en si ha sigut llocs de discussió, la pedagogia crítica té una llarga trajectòria i per tant ha pogut debatre amb totes aquestes perspectives i és en aquest sentit que aquesta trobada pot ser interessant també per reprendre alguns d'aquests debats. A més, donat el panorama polític recent, ara penso que també és més rellevant que mai el poder tornar a escoltar aquestes discussions, reprendre aquest esperit de les pedagogies crítiques, en tot allò que dins de la seva pluralitat les connecta, aquesta idea d'una democràcia radical, aquesta reclamació d'aquesta democràcia radical, la justícia social com quelcom irrenunciable i sobretot de l'educació com un àmbit clau en aquestes lluites. Per tant, és més pertinent que mai alguns debats. I per tant, seria interessant que aquesta conversa ens fes sortir, com el títol indica, sobretot l'última part, una mica més esperançades en aquest context una mica obscur en què estem vivint ara i que ens enduguem aquesta esperança als nostres espais de treball i de lluita. Dit això, us explico una mica de fet qui som aquí. Les últimes informacions que teníem, que segurament han variat en els últims dies, és que s'havien inscrit més de 200 persones, i crec que això és bastant visible en la sala, que més de la meitat sou docents o educadores en actiu. Per tant, això és com molt interessant. També hi ha un percentatge important, més del 20, al voltant del 22, de gestors culturals i responsables de serveis educatius. Això també em sembla rellevant. També estudiants en un 10% i un 8% de funcionaris administratius i altres. Per tant, crec que és molt interessant veure com aquesta no és una audiència, com no és un auditori ple d'acadèmics, que només tinguem interès a escoltar teories, sinó que tothom necessita portar aquesta teoria a la pràctica i moure's de la pràctica a la teoria també. I això crec que ho farà molt productiu. Com sabeu, el que havíem decidit era que d'alguna manera les preguntes vinguessin amb antelació. Primer, perquè tothom tingués més temps de pensar-se-les i també per poder distribuir el debat d'una manera potser més equilibrada o productiva. Llavors, el format de la sessió serà el següent. Primer tindrem una presentació de Henry Giroux durant aproximadament uns 20-25 minuts per poder reservar una hora de diàleg que estarà feta a partir de les preguntes que heu enviat amb antelació. Respecte a això, només un petit detall és que qui les hagi enviat aquesta setmana ja no hem estat a temps de recollir-les. Per tant, la data de termini ens ha marcat que algunes potser s'hagin perdut. I això ho sentim, però tampoc no podíem estar amb aquest marge tan curt. D'acord? Aquesta selecció l'hem feta al voltant, segons diversos criteris. Un era que s'ajustessin els eixos de debat per evitar dispersar la discussió. L'altre era també equilibrar les temàtiques. I haig de dir que sobretot la línia de treball sobre la noció de resistència ha sigut la que més preguntes ha rebut. I això ho podem interpretar de manera simptomàtica, si voleu. En canvi, les relatives a l'esperança eren bastant poquetes. Per tant, equilibrar el debat també era important. I finalment també hem preferit aquelles que podien obrir debats més nous a mantenir amb Henry Giroux. Potser coses que ja ha treballat a bastament, potser són preguntes que ens hem estalviat en el sentit que n'ha escrit prou i potser es poden recuperar des d'allà. Llavors potser algunes que o linkin els seus debats amb el context local o del present i hi ha preguntes que portin el debat a un altre lloc. D'acord? Aquestes preguntes estaran fetes en anglès, sobretot per fer més fluït el diàleg. Per tant, li preguntarem en anglès i es funcionarà amb traducció per no haver d'estar esperant mútuament a traduir-se. Serà l'únic moment en què es farà en anglès és per aquest motiu, per fer més fluïda la conversa. I la idea és que al final ens quedin tot i així 15 minuts per preguntes obertes, per si algú en té alguna més a aportar o si alguna de les coses discutides li ha fet pensar alguna altra qüestió que estaria bé plantejar-se. Com sempre, ja sabeu que el temps en aquestes coses va fatal. 
Intentarem que tot i així hi hagi temps per tot i que puguem discutir totes les qüestions que tenim pendents. Llavors, precisament per això mateix no m'allargo més. I, si vols venir a la llista, li deixo el mic a tu. Thank you very much. It's really, truly an honor to be here. I've never been to Girona before, so I'm, I, feel, um, I feel right at home in some ways, given the, the circumstances that are going on here. Let me, let me give you a sense of what I want to do tonight before I actually begin. Um, I'm going to talk about basically three things. I'm going to talk about critical pedagogy, I'm going to talk about politics and culture, and I'm going to talk about the discourse of critique and possibility. But I, like, like, it, it seems to me that th this particular set of topics has to be understood within a larger framework, and that framework basically is about the rise of neo-fascism in the world today. And I think that um, you, you can't separate topics of this sort from that sort of context. So I'm basically going to focus on some of that before I actually allow the, this, these topics to unfold. And of course, I'm also going to talk about Donald Trump, uh, because it seems to me that Donald Trump is, in some way is significant certainly in terms of the rise of neo-fascist movements that are going on all over the world because he emboldens them, to say the very least, and he's very unapologetic about what he's doing. So let me uh, put these things in that context and then I'll get down to what I want to talk about. Something sinister and horrifying is happening to liberal democracies all over the globe, except for Spain. Democratic institutions such as the independent media, schools, the legal system, certain financial institutions, and higher education are under siege. Not only it, it, it seems to be in the United States, but of course worldwide. Some of the latest examples can be found with the resurgence in the United States of vigilantes and right-wing militia groups along the southern border and the intrusion of tech-based educational practices into schools, producing curricula that some parents claim turn kids into zombies. Trump's continued attack on higher education offers another highly visible example. His proposed 2020 budget request would enact a staggering $7.1 billion reduction in the education department as part of a policy to dismantle the department itself. You have to understand, of course, that Trump seems to believe that any form of thinking that doesn't operate on the side of ignorance operates on the side of angels. At the same time, the promise of democracy is receding as present-day fascists work to subvert language, values, courage, vision, and, criti and a critical consciousness. Education increasingly becomes a tool of domination as the entrepreneurs of hate deploy right-wing pedagogical practices to attack workers, black youth, refugees, immigrants, and others, others that they consider disposable. In the midst of a moment when an, old, when an older social order is crumbling and a new one is struggling to define itself, there emerges a time of confusion, danger, and moments of great restlessness. We are once again at an historical conjuncture in which the structures of liberation and authoritarianism are vying over the future. We have arrived at such a moment in which two worlds are pitted against each other. And a history of the present is poised at a point when possibilities are either realized or rejected, but never disappear completely. Two worlds are colliding. First, as a number of scholars have observed, there is the harsh and crumbling world of neoliberal globalization and its mobilizing passions that fuel different strands of fascism across the globe. Power is now enamored with amassing profits and capital and is increasingly addicted to a politics of white nationalism and racial cleansing. Second, there is a world of counter movements, which is growing, especially among young people, with their search for a new politics in which they can rethink, reclaim, and invent a new understanding of democratic socialism untainted by capitalism. It's hard to imagine a more urgent moment for making education central to politics. If we're going to develop a politics capable of awakening our critical, imaginative, and historical possibilities or sensibilities, it's crucial for educators and others to develop a language of both critique and possibility. 
Such a language is necessary to enable the conditions to forge a collective international resistance among educators, youth, artists, and other cultural workers in defense of public goods. Such a movement is important in order to resist and overcome the tyrannical fascist nightmares that have descended upon the United States, Brazil, and a number of other countries in Europe plagued by the rise of neo-Nazi parties. In an age of social isolation, information overflow, a culture of immediacy, consumer glut, and spectacularized violence, it's all the more crucial to take seriously the notion that a democracy cannot be defended or exist, or exist without informed, critically engaged citizens. The pedagogical lesson here is that fascism begins with words, hateful words the demonization of others considered disposable and moves to attack on our, and, and moves in an attack on ideas the burning of books the disappearance of intellectuals and the emergence of the carceral state and the horrors of detention jails and camps as a form of cultural politics critical pedagogy promises provides the promise of a protected space within which again to think against the grain of received opinion a space to question and challenge, to imagine the world from different viewpoints and perspectives, to reflect upon ourselves in relation to others, and in so doing, to understand what it means to assume a sense of political and social responsibility. Education in both its institutional and symbolic forms has a central role to play in fighting the resurgence of fascist cultures, mythic historical narratives and the emerging ideologies of white supremacy and white nationalism. Moreover, at a time when fascists across the globe are disseminating toxic, racist, and ultra-nationalist images of the past, it's essential to reclaim critical pedagogy as a form of historical consciousness and a form of moral witnessing. This is especially true at a time when historical and social amnesia have become a national pastime, particularly in the United States, matched only by the masculinization of the public sphere and the increasing normalization of a fascist politics that thrives on ignorance, fear, hatred, social cleansing, the suppression of dissent, and white supremacy. Education as a form of cultural work extends far beyond the classroom and its pedagogical influence. Often, while, uh, while often imperceptible, it's crucial to, ch to challenging and resisting the rise once again of fascist pedagogical formations and, their re and the rehabilitation of what we might call fascist principles and ideas. Cultural politics in the last 20 years has turned toxic as ruling elites increasingly gain control of the commanding cultural apparatuses, turning them into pedagogical disimagination machines that serve the forces of ethical tranquilization by producing and legitimating endless degrading and humiliating images of the poor, immigrants, Muslims, and others considered excess, wasted lives, doomed to terminal exclusion. The capitalist dream machine is back with huge profits for the ultra-rich, hedge fund managers, and major players in the major financial service industries. In these new landscapes of wealth, fraud, and social atomization, a brutal and fanatical capitalism promotes a winner-take-all ethos, a culture of cruelty and white nationalism, aggressively undermining the welfare state while pushing millions into hardships and misfortune. The geographies of moral and political decadence have become the organizing standard of the dream, of, of the dream worlds of consumption, privatization, surveillance, and deregulation. And within this increasingly fascist landscape, public spheres are replaced by zones of social abandonment and, try and thrive on the energies of the walking dead and the avatars of cruelty and misery. I mean, I think that what's important to understand here, and it's very simple, as the punishing state increases, the social state, dimin social state diminishes. As we spend more on the military, we spend more on the police, we spend more on arming with the police with the abandoned weapons of war from Iraq and Afghanistan, 
eliminated, the social state is eliminated. Less for schools, less for teachers, less for health care, less for the things that make people in some way believe that the dream of living the good life is actually possible. Education within the last three decades has diminished rapidly in its capacities to educate people and others to be critical and socially engaged agents. Under neoliberal regimes now flirting with toxic, idio toxic ideologies, the apostles of authoritarianism have deemed the utopian possibilities formerly associated with public education as too dangerous to go unchecked. Increasingly, public schools, which could, which could have such a radical potential to promote social equality and support democratic values, are falling subject to the toxic forces of privatization and mindless standardized curricula, while teachers are subjected to intolerable labor conditions. Higher education now mimics a business culture run by a managerial army of bureaucrats, drunk on market values, who resemble the high priest of a kind of deadening instrumental rationality. The struggle, however, is far from over. The good news <clears throat> is that there is an increasing wave of strikes by teachers, public servers, and workers, both in the United States and abroad, who are resisting the cruel machinery of exploitation, racism, austerity, and disposability unleashed by neoliberal capital in the last 40 years. Critical thought and the imagining of a, of a better world present a direct threat to neoliberal rationality in which the future always replicates the present in an endless cycle in which capital and the identities that it legitimates merge with each other into what might be called dead zones of the imagination and pedagogies of repression. This dystopian impulse thrives on producing myriad forms of inequality and violence, encompassing both the, sub the, the symbolic and the structural as part of a broader attempt to define education in purely instrumental, privatized, and intellectual, anti-intellectual terms. What is clear is that the neoliberal modes of education attempt to mold students in, in, in what I would call the image in the market-driven mantras of self-interest, harsh competition, unchecked individualism, and the ethos of consumerism. Young people are now told to invest in their careers pack their resumes, and achieve success at any cost. It's precisely this replacement of educated hope with an aggressive, dystopian, neoliberal project and cultural politics that now characterizes the current assault on public and higher education in many parts of the globe. And it seems to me it's crucial for educators to remember that language is not just simply the ins an instrument of fear, violence, and, and intimidation. It's also a vehicle of critique, civic courage, resistance, and engaged and informed agency. <clears throat> we live at a time when the language of democracy has been pillaged, stripped of its promises and hopes, and if racism, if fascism is to be defeated, there is a need to make education an organizing principle of politics. And in part, this can be done with a language that exposes and unravels the falsehoods, the systems of oppression, and corrupt relations of power, while making clear that alternative, an alternative future is possible. This is even more reason for educators to make the political more pedagogical and the pedagogical more political in order to recognize that pedagogy is always a struggle over agency, identities, desire, and values, while also acknowledging that it has a crucial role to play in, in, in dealing with important social issues and defending public and higher education as democratic public spheres. Making the political more pedagogical, in this instance, suggests producing modes of knowledge and social practices that not only affirm oppositional cultural work and pedagogical practices, but also offer opportunities to mobilize instances of collective outrage, coupled with direct mass action against a ruthless casino capitalism and an emerging fascist politics. Such mobilization must oppose the glaring material inequities and the growing cynical belief that democracy and capitalism are synonymous. At the very least, 
Critical pedagogy proposes that education is a form of political intervention in the world and that it's capable of creating the possibilities for individual and social transformation. Given the current crisis of politics, agency, history, and memory, educators need a new pedagogical and political language for addressing the changing context and issues facing a world in which capital draws on an unprecedented convergence of resources, financial, cultural, political, economic, scientific, military, and technological to exercise powerful and diverse forms of direct and indirect control. If educators and other are to counter global capitalism's increasing ability to separate the traditional sphere of politics from the now transnational reach of power, it seems to me that it's crucial to reject educational approaches that collapse the distinction between market liberties and civil liberties, a market economy and a market society, and capitalism and democracy. Resistance does not begin with reforming capitalism, but abolishing it. Neoliberal capitalism creates the foundation for what I have called in my other work, neoliberal fascism, and echoes Max Horkheimer's dictum in 1939 that whoever is not prepared to talk about capitalism should also remain silent about fascism. In this instance, critical pedagogy becomes a political and moral practice in the fight to revive civic literacy, civic culture, and a notion of shared citizenship. Politics loses its emancipatory possibilities if it cannot provide the educational conditions for enabling students in order to think against the grain and to realize themselves as informed, critical, and engaged citizens. There is no radical politics, no politics that matters without a pedagogy capable of awakening consciousness, challenging common sense, and creating modes of now analysis in which people discover a moment of recognition that enables them to rethink the conditions that shape their lives. This is the moment of hope, which as Ruth Levitas points out, the sense of something missing can be read in every trace of how it might be otherwise, how the ever-present of lack might be, might be tempered. As a matter of political and social responsibility, it seems to me that educators should do more than create the conditions for critical thinking and nourishing a sense of hope for their students. They also need to be responsible and assume the role of civic educators within broader social and political context and be willing to share their ideas with other educators and the wider public by making use of the new media and technology and traditional modes of communication. I don't want to stray from the text, but I must tell you, you know, I started a truth out not too long ago, something called the Public Intellectual Project in which I asked academics all over the United States and in Europe and many places to begin to write articles about issues that mattered in a language that was both accessible but at the same time rigorous. I, I could barely find intellectuals who would do it. I mean, they, they simply could not make the translation. And, uh, and it's interesting for me because it seems to me that at the very least what intellectuals have to be able to do is to be able to defend to the public the very conditions of their own labor. They have to be able to defend what they do. They can't say, I wrote, I write five, I, I've written five books and five people have read them. It's not enough. I mean, it seems to me, how do you elevate ideas to the public realm in a way that's both, that doesn't compromise intellectual in integrity, that doesn't compromise theory, but at the same time offers a narrative in which people have something to say to other people and which they can recognize themselves in that narrative. What's that moment of identification where people can read something and say, yes, I'm there, I get it, that's part of my life that changes the way in which the language I use allows me to understand how I relate to myself, others, and, and the wider world. It seems to me that a, a number of academics and teachers in the current moment have joined forces with right-wing pundits and begin to argue that education should be free of politics. Their falsely shared conclusion is that schools should be neutral places in which matters of power, values, social justice should, be should, should, uh, should not be addressed and should not enter the classroom. This is a very interesting theory. It suggests that teachers should believe in nothing. 
It suggests that teachers don't have any values, and it suggests that they do have values and they have something to say in the classroom, that the only way they can do that is to indoctrinate students. This is, a, this is an argument that basically confuses education with training. It seems to me that, of course, this view of teaching being neutral or free of politics is as much a flight from reality as it is an instance of irresponsible pedagogy. In contrast, one useful approach to embracing the classroom as a political site while rejecting any form of indoctrination is for educators to think through the distinction between what I want to call a, pol a politicizing pedagogy and a political pedagogy. A politicizing pedagogy insists wrongly that students should think exactly as we do, while a, pedag a political pedagogy teaches students through informed dialogue and critical engagement about the importance of power, social responsibility, and taking a stand without standing still. Political pedagogy, unlike dogmatic or indoctrinating pedagogy, embodies the principles of dialogue, rigorously engaging students in the full range of the best of historical knowledge and ideas within a framework that en enables students to move from a moral purpose to a pers purposeful action in pursuit of thinking through the demands of a strong democracy. I mean, it seems to me if we're going to talk about what, what pedagogy means, we have to begin with something uh, it, it, at the beginning, and that is that pedagogy is always a struggle over agency. It's always a struggle over what it means for students to be able to narrate themselves within particular relations of power, within particular, uh, it, it seems to me, sets of values, within a particular notion of the future. There is no education that can ignore this, from the books we choose, to the way in which we teach, to the way in which we nurture the capacities for students to be critical thinking. That's a political act. Education is always a struggle about some sense of what the future means. And to deny that is in fact to indoctrinate students by making it appear that what we have to say is not rooted in a particular sense of values, not rooted in a particular sense of agency, not rooted in a particular sense of history. What is important about critical pedagogy, it seems to me, is its emphasis on, is its emphasis on how responsibility is understood both as an ethical issue and a strategic act. Responsibility is not only a crucial element in regarding what issues teachers address in the classroom, it's also embodied in their relationship to their colleagues, the students, the parents, and the wider society. Education, it seems to me, operates as a crucial site of power in the modern world. And if teachers are truly concerned about safeguarding education, they're going to have to take seriously how pedagogy functions not just in schools, but in a whole range of apparatuses, both at a, national, at a regional, national, state, and international level. Critical pedagogy has an important role to play in understanding and challenging how power, knowledge, and values are deployed, affirmed, and resisted within and outside traditional discourses and cultural spheres. In the local context, pedagogy becomes an important theoretical tool for understanding the institutional conditions that place constraints on the production of learning, that place constraints on academic labor, that place constraints on social relations and democracy itself. We're not just talking about some neutral sort of a prescribed map that you impose on students, on schools, and on teachers. We're talking about how a society understands what education means and what it does to shape that mode of education in a particular way that can be either about the practice of freedom or in some ways can be about the practice of domination. It seems to me that another object, another issue that has to be taken up in this project is that how do we give teachers and students the opportunity to create the conditions for them to in some way have some understanding that any language of critique has to be understood as part of the language of hope. And when I talk about hope, I'm not talking about some silly Disney-like sense of hope in which one says, well, we just hope for the better. I'm talking about educated hope. I'm talking about the need to overlook, not to overlook, the difficult conditions that both shape schools in the larger social order. Nor is hope, in this sense, a blueprint removed from specific contexts and struggles. Educated hope provides the basis for dignifying the labor of teachers. It offers up a critical knowledge linked to democratic social change. It affirms shared responsibilities, and it encourages teachers and students to recognize ambivalence and uncertainty as a fundamental dimension of learning. Such hope 
offers the possibility of thinking beyond the given. As difficult as this task may seem to educators, if not to a larger pub public, it's a struggle worth waging. <clears throat> in an age of poisonous capitalism and an emerging fascist politics, I would think that educated students and other concerned citizens face the challenge of providing a language that embraces a militant utopianism while constantly being attentive to those forces that seek to turn hope into a new slogan or to punish, or an easy slogan, or to punish those who dare to look beyond the horizons of the given. Fascism breeds cynicism and is the enemy of a militant and social hope. Hope must be tempered by the complex reality of the times and viewed as a project and a condition for providing a collective agency, opposition, a political imagination, and engaged participation. And if I really had to sum this up, I would say, without hope, even in the most dire times, there is no possibility for resistance. There is no possibility for struggle. There is no possibility for dissent. Agency is the condition of struggle, and hope is the condition of agency. Hope expands the space of the possible and becomes a way of recognizing and naming the incomplete nature of the present. One of the things that I love about youth struggles all over the world is that what I hear repeatedly from young people is they have been written out of the script of the future. They have been written out. They're now told your lives will be no better, if not worse, than your parents. They're now told you're not, you're, it's, it's, it's unacceptable for you to believe in a society very different from the one you live in. It's unacceptable to imagine the unimaginable. It's unacceptable to think otherwise in order to act otherwise and they don't buy it, rightly so. Hope, it seems to me, is the affective and intellectual precondition for individual and social struggle. Hope, not despair, is the precondition that encourages critique on the part of intellectuals and cultural workers and artists and concerned citizens and others inside and outside of the academy who use the resources of theory to address important social problems. Hope is the root of civic courage. The current fight against a nascent fascism across the globe is not only a fight or a struggle over economic structures or the commanding heights of corporate power, it's also a struggle over visions, ideas, consciousness, and the power to shift the culture itself. It's also, as Anna Harant has said, a struggle against a widespread fear of judging. Without the ability to judge, it becomes impossible to recover words that have meaning. Imagine alternative worlds and a future that does not mimic the dark times in which we live. Any struggle for a radical democratic social order will not take place if the lessons from our dark past cannot be learned and transformed into constructive resolutions and solutions for struggling for and against a post-capitalist society. In the end, there is no democracy without informed citizens and no justice without a language critical of injustice. Democracies begin to fall and to begin to fail Democracies begin to fail and political life becomes impoverished in the absence of those vital public spheres and such as public and higher education in which civic values, public scholarship, and social engagement allow for a more imaginative grasp of the future that takes seriously the demands of justice, equity, and civic courage. Democracy should be, should be a way of thinking about education one that thrives on connecting pedagogy to the practice of freedom, learning to ethics, and agency to the imperatives of social responsibility and the public good. In an age of nascent, fasc nascent fascism, it's not enough to connect education with the defense of reason, informed judgment, and critical agency. It must also be aligned with the power and the potential of collective resistance. Moreover, it's crucial that the centrists the liberals and the radicals not make cause with those on the right over the idea that classrooms should be free of politics. We may live in dark times, but the future is still open. The time has come to develop a political language and pedagogical tools in which civic, civic values, social responsibility, 
and the institutions that support them become central to invigorating and fortifying a new era of civic imagination, a renewed sense of social agency, collective struggle, and an impassioned sense of civic courage and political will. Thank you. Okay, as I said before, this is going to be in English. And uh, what I'm going to do is to share some of the questions from the audience. Also, maybe at the beginning we'll have some questions also from the organization, or maybe we'll ask you to expand on some ideas that you have shared with us during the talk, but then we have several questions for you. And this is going to be like 45 minutes or 50, so we can have some time at the end. I, I, I have to apologize for talking into a phallic symbol. But... <laughs> There was no other way that, uh, we could arrange it. <laughs> okay. Um, there's like three dimensions in this debate. The first one is about critical pedagogy as a form of resistance. This, this is a terrible echo. You're echoing. But... I, I am. I know. This is a chart. Okay. I'm afraid. I'll that... try, I'll try to. Yeah. Okay. The second. Um... What was the first question? No, no, is it like wide fields of debate that we will cover through questions. I'm just reminding it both to ourselves and then the audience. The first one is critical pedagogy as a form of resistance. The second one is social transformation through culture. And the final one is educating for hope. And then we will cover these three areas and I will mention those clearly so they can change the slide and it's clearly on screen. So now we have critical pedagogy as a form of resistance. And you've been talking about language as a very important element, and we were discussing before about how language has been somehow kidnapped by certain forces in a way that, for example, allows them to use liberty or freedom in, on the kind of right wing of the political spectrum, and they are the ones talking about freedom of speech, freedom, and so on, in a way that somehow stripped the left from those kind of words. And I wanted to use that uh, discussion about language that you were sharing with us during the talk. By the way, thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, and then move towards this uh, idea of the struggle for language. Language is not something take it for granted, but something that, that involves some struggle, a struggle about hegemony on the discourse. How do we deal with that in a political era like this one? And also, I, want, I wanted you to, if you can, to expand a little bit on this, because I think that this is linked to some very non-rational elements that somehow are not present in the discourse, uh, especially in critical pedagogy, sometimes the non-rational elements are not so clearly seen, like these desires, fears, and I think that in language, both elements of rationality and non-rationality are colliding in the struggle for hegemony, and I think that now in, in terms of politics and also relating to education, these elements of non-rationality in language are also very present. So how do we do, how do we um, engage in this struggle for social justice, etc., when those words are no longer ours and that they are the object of a, of a very um, dramatic struggle for the meaning, also with a lot of non-rational elements at play. So if you could just talk a little bit about this and then we move to the questions from the audience, if that's yeah, possible. Yeah. Okay. I, I, uh... I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, work through a series of points that you've made and in the best way that I can. I, I mean, I, I, I think that what the struggle over language and its colonization by the most irrational forces that we can imagine have, has t that has taken place in the last 40 years, in some way enters a new phase in the 1970s all over the world. Because what begins to happen is that neoliberalism which is the most extreme form of capitalism, with the fall of the, of the fall of course the Soviet Union and the alleged death of, of socialism, takes on a life of its own. It becomes normalized, and in that language, we in the, you see this language emerging in a, in a very famous marriage. Ronald Reagan married Margaret Thatcher, and they had a child, and that child was called. There is no alternative. And it, and it seems to me that the most pernicious part of that, that, that marriage and that birth, if I may carry this even further, 
was that all problems are now individualized. That there's no such thing as under, under understanding the relationship between private troubles and larger systemic considerations. The social begins to drop out of language. Community begins to drop out of language. Democracy begins to drop out of the language, particularly of the right. And instead of that language, we get the language of, of excessive individualism, radical individual, a, a radicalized individualism, in which all social problems, as I said, are now one has to bear the benefit of those problems by oneself. But we also get a, a kind of ethos that seems to suggest that we're in a war, a Hobbesian world of a war of you know, all against all. That self-interest is the highest national ideal. That citizenship is basically about consuming. Uh, that compassion is a liability. That justice basically is only something that can be used in an advertisement to sell goods. That love has nothing to do with anything except commodities. But, but one of the most pernicious, it seems to me, elements used to strip language of any meaning and to normalize this new sort of crypto neoliberal fascist order. And, and trust me when I say to you, I don't use these terms lightly. When I say neoliberal fascism, what I'm saying is that neoliberalism has created conditions of such massive suffering, such massive misery, such massive inequality, such massive hardship, that it creates the grounds for a language of simplicity. It creates the ground of a language of people who claim that they will save you. It creates the ground for mobilizing the needs for some, some, some alternative outside of established corrupt political parties that takes on the romance. It, 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 to put it in, as Ernst Bloch once said, it deals with very genuine needs, but it offers the swindle of fulfillment. And it seems to me that at the heart of that swindle of fulfillment is the denial of certain inequalities like class, race, gender, uh, and so forth and so on. But there is something about the notion of freedom. Freedom gets perverted in such a way that it becomes very difficult to understand freedom in the larger sense of having to do with the public good. And here's what I mean by that. At the heart of a neoliberal ethic and fascist ethic of freedom, it seems to me, is the notion of choice. You have choices. Everybody has a choice. You have a choice to, to if, you're, if, if you're walking along one night, you don't know where to sleep, you can go to the Ritz or you can sleep under a bridge. It's nonsense, you know it's nonsense, and I know it's nonsense because choices are defined by constraints. The choices we have are defined by the constraints in which we find ourselves. And in many cases, those constraints, as we well know, are distributed vastly unequal. My father was a worker and a truck driver. And when my father's car broke down, he walked home. Because time was a deprivation for him. Because he didn't have the money to, to call somebody and get it fixed. He was always operating in a mode of survival. So his choices were enormously limited. I have taught in schools where parents basically supplied the money for their kids to have Olympic swimming pools. The constraints on their choices are limited. Their sense of the possibility of their agency are limited, is, uh, is limited. Now, what comes along with that notion of choice, particularly for people like myself from the working class, is that we not only have less constraint, we have more constraints in able to enact those choices. So freedom becomes a very limited kind of term for us that actually functions in a way to disparage us because it says we don't take advantage of that freedom and therefore we should be defined by our deficits not our strengths. And so it seems to me that this struggle over language, this appropriation of language, is really a struggle over agency. It's a struggle over whether or not you can imagine something beyond the future. It's a struggle over courage. It's a struggle over facing the complexities of the world in which we, we find ourselves and not believing the narratives they give us to suggest that we're responsible for the narratives they create. So the struggle of a language is important. And it seems to me, and I'll end with this. Look, we often talk about learning as what it is we need to learn. But I think actually there's another, there's another dimension to learning that has something to do with the question of language. And that is, what do we need to unlearn? What have we become that we need to get rid of? What are the hidden curriculums that operate under every pedagogical site? 
that are not explicit about what they're doing to us, but are like a reality TV, you know, and saying, hey, look, there's only one person left on the island, and that should be you. You know, how do we not mimic those values embedded in their language, which is always a language that often is at odds with questions of freedom and justice and equality? Because it's a language that blames the victims. It's not a language that is self-reflective about the people who have power. Okay, thank you. That was a way to begin to I'm go sorry, into that the was question. A bit too long. No, it's okay. I, I keep an eye on my watch. Don't. <laughs> I will make faces. No, it's okay. It's Just perfect. tell me to be quiet. I'll no, it's okay. it's great. It's, I mean, the idea was to have this dialogue. So let's make. Let's use this time. Right. Uh, no problem. I, I will move to the questions from the audience that we received during these days. And I have a, um, a first one, which is maybe not so related to this issue of, of uh, resistance, but it's a more general question on critical pedagogy as a very important trend in pedagogy that has opened so many debates, as I mentioned at the beginning. And it's a very specific question, and I will mostly read. So I kind of respect the writing of the person who sent it, although I had to translate it. And it goes like this. It says, critical pedagogy has had a limited influence on educational practices, whereas the conservative political forces have been able to monopolize the public debate on education. Could it be because critical pedagogy focuses mainly on analysis and critique and not so on analysis and critique. So critical pedagogy, you know that this has been a very uh, long debate about, this is more mostly about structures and critique and analysis, and maybe not so much on proposing alternative forms of educational organization, of teaching and learning strategies, curricula, interpersonal personal relations, etc. Is it possible to offer concrete and plausible responses to the real problems in education, thus challenging the hegemony of the conservative powers? And let me mention, I haven't done it before, sorry, I forgot, but this question comes from Xavier Besalú Costa, who is a professor of pedagogy at the University of Girona. So it's, I think it's a the thing is that the right wing has very clear answers for those problems and uh, understanding that it is important not to give recipes that are easily reproduced because that doesn't make any sense and each debate and political decisions are contextualized. At the same time, they have this force. I mean, they can give very specific and concrete solutions. So could it be like an, an, an oppositional view of those concrete questions from a critical perspective in pedagogy. What do you think about that? Well, I, I mean, I, I think we have to be very careful because I, I don't think the, the question of education begins with the question of how to organize the classroom. I think it begins with the question of what education is for. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that once you begin with that question, then what follows is, you know, how do, how do you begin to organize and teach in ways, for instance, to make something meaningful in order to make it critical, in order, in order to make it uh, transformative. We have enormous numbers of instances of critical pedagogy at work in very specific ways, whether we're looking at the free school movement of the 1960s, or whether we're looking at the work of Paulo Freire, or whether we're looking at, at the work of pedagogy and, and theater. Uh, there are an enormous number of influences, but I, I, I think that the, 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 the point that the right has very speci makes very specific interventions, these interventions are always on the side of a kind of anti-intellectualism, because they basically say teachers don't have to think, all they have to do is follow the instructions and a class will work by, the, by, by virtue of a set of preordained scripts. I, and I'll tell you a story about how this works. I remember teaching at Boston University and I had somebody knock on my door one day and he came in and he said, boy, have I got a curricula for you to teach to your students? I said, really? He said, it's teacher proof. I said, great, come right in. <laughs> you know, he left quickly. I, I mean, and, and I think that what we're dealing with here often is a, a notion of educational innovation that really operates in, in, in a kind of dystopian way to do away with anything that's innovative because it's always on the side of prescribed interventions. And the real question we have to ask about that discourse is what it leaves out. What does it leave out? What is missing here? Does it give teachers more autonomy? Does it talk about the fact that pedagogy should always be cultural specific, culturally specific? Does it talk about the fact we need smaller classrooms? Does it talk about the fact that education should not function in a way as to kill children's imagination? That the arts should be absolutely central to education and play an, an important fundamental role in, 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 in a sense stretching the power of the imagination? You don't hear that discourse. Simply because it's dominant and simply because it's prescriptive doesn't mean the left has failed. 
It simply means the left doesn't have the power to get the, the, that, that their positions out in a way that would often be taken seriously because they don't have control of the, the, the major cultural apparatuses. I mean, in, in a sense, what they often do is under attack to such a degree that even those teachers who are implementing this type of pedagogy are often fired. You know, often they, they pay a terrible price. I'll give you an example, one last example. In the United States, 70% of all faculty now are on non-tenured tracks. Think about it. They teach two or three courses. Their contracts are renewed each year. They, have, they get lower, meager social provisions. Their salaries are terrible. Do you really think they're going to speak out? This is not just a matter of, of, of debilitating labor. This is a matter of stifling academic freedom. Because what tenure gives you is academic freedom. I can't believe in any form of education in which a teacher doesn't have some autonomy over the nature of their classroom, some autonomy over the nature of their, of their working conditions, and that the state doesn't take education so seriously that it will pay them as much as it pays the, higher, the highest professionals in any society. Educators are the most important people, in my estimation, in any democracy. They're the ones who keep it going. So we need a language for them that's empowering, not a language that's prescriptive. Don't blame the left for a language that's prescriptive. Blame the right. Let's say, well, that's the wrong language. I mean, that's not a deficiency on the part of the left. That's an ability of the right to understand that they can deal in simplisms and get away with it because they're constantly eliminating those social and political and pedagogical institutions that allow people to make the kinds of critiques that are necessary to prove that that language is a fraud. That, I think that might link to an, another question from another uh, member of the audience. It's Miguel Blanc Solé, who defines himself as a retired teacher. And um, it's not exactly about the same, but it's given that they have this freedom, the question goes like this. It's about political literacy. Yeah. And, it's, um, and he says, literacy is a changing concept. In the 19th century, illiteracy meant that someone wasn't able to read and write, whereas nowadays we can speak of digital or even political illiteracy. University students may well finish their degrees and be complete ignorant in economic, political or social matters. And the working classes may vote right-wing parties that will make their situation worse. How can we fight political illiteracy? And it links with that. I mean, having the freedom, how comes that this kind of is so difficult? I'm having a terrible time with this echo. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's really, it's really, it's very difficult to understand you. Do you uh, want me to? Maybe we should take it off and. Okay. Yeah. I use it. How about this? That's is this better. better? Yeah. I, I, tell me if I got your question. All right. I, I believe the question was, um, how do we rescue a notion of political literacy that matters? Yes, and also. I think that the quest, there's, in the question there's an element of, since we have the freedom, how come that still working classes vote to parties that will make yeah. their life more difficult? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. You know, so we have the freedom, but still we don't actualize that freedom yeah. into options that actually make us freer, in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that if I'm getting it, and please forgive me, I'll try to understand this in three registers, OK? okay. The first register is to talk about that technology as an end in itself is a mistake. I think we really have to talk about the kind of values that inform the way in which people use these technologies that basically now speak to multiple literacies. You can't talk about literacy in the singular anymore. I mean, my generation is a generation of print culture. That was a particular form of literacy. But it, there's also another understanding of literacy beyond the fact that it can't be singular and has to be multiple, and that students have to be multiply literate to be able to work in the, to understand the world themselves and how to deal with others. The other side of this is that literacy is not just a skill. I mean, I think that when we talk about literacy as mastering, for instance, Facebook, you know, or mastering digital technologies, or, you know, that's a reading, producing code. What, what we often miss in that is literacy is also about the, the possibility of not only reading the world critically and reading technologies critically, but intervening in the world. Literacy is about degree to which it provides the conditions for people to be real agents, to learn how to govern rather than be governed. Secondly, I'm not particularly strong on the notion that students in some way should be critically literate of these various literacies. I mean, they should be literate in multiple ways, right? They also should be cultural producers. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just concerned about literacy as an act of mastery uh, in, in, in terms of the possibilities for for expanding the range of knowledge that one knows and what it means to intervene in the world. I want to know what it means for them to produce things. 
You know, to use these literacies to produce radio programs, to produce television programs, to be involved, it seems to me, in the wider culture in a way that is at odds and, under, and, and, and is capable of holding power accountable in the way that mainstream established and new media doesn't. I don't think we can survive without a generation of young people who are also cultural producers because the monopolies of the cultural apparatuses, whether it be Google you know, uh, or whatever, uh, uh, Microsoft, this, these have to be challenged. And that's not a call to live in alternative worlds and no other world. It's a call to have one foot in and one foot out. One foot out as a cultural producer doing the things that provide alternative ways of understanding the world, and one foot in in working in those institutions that are established so that we don't turn them over to, to the right and we take them seriously as sites of struggle. Okay. Since we were talking about uh, cultural production, understanding students as cultural producers, and I think that that's very interesting to understand education not just uh, a sphere of uh, reproduction, but also a sphere of production. I think that's essential. I will move now to this uh, second dimension of our debate, which is social transformation through culture. Uh, there's a slide. Um, so I think it links very well, talking about culture and then moving into this. And uh, again, it's more an introduction from the organization, from us, before we move to the questions. And uh, you mentioned before the, the cultural apparatuses, and you also talked, I think that was more in the printed version of your talk, about the ruling elites that gain control over cultural apparatuses. And then the question is that culture is usually considered as a very positive term, and is used affirmatively, like culture is good, we should have culture, culture ma makes us freer. But then culture is also a terrain for privilege, for difference, for distinction, for reproduction, and that sociology of ours and Bourdieu has studied that extensively, and also is put at the service of multinational media industry. So the, to start talking about culture, the question would be something like, how can we transform culture in a way that it can contribute to more just society? How, what kind of culture, what kind of cultural practices, because not all of them are necessarily productive in that respect. More of them, more, many of them can be very repressive and reproductive and disciplining. So what kind of culture you envision, what kind of cultural practices you see as a, something that might help us find this social yeah, I, justice? I mean, I, I think that, you know, that one of the first things we have to understand about culture is that culture is a vastly diverse educational apparatus. Mm -hmm. um, and in some way, we can talk about culture as a teaching machine because what culture does is it provides the narratives, it provides the values, it provides the social relations that in its worst dimension is really basically about simply reproducing the status quo. Uh, or it can be used by elites to suggest that it's purely an aesthetic formalized sort of uh, register and that uh, the elites are really, because they're, they're very smart, uh, this, this is a, the culture somehow civilizes them. I mean, you know, it's sort of at odds with the fact that Nats, the Nazis loved high art, right? Uh, but, I, but I think the third culture, the third understanding of culture, one that has been around for a long time, particularly in the British tradition, Raymond Williams, the, the cultural studies movement uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, the sociology of education, they talked about the culture of everyday life and how we understand that. Because it seems to me that, you know, if Vaclav Havel has a phrase that I love, he says, politics follows culture. And what he basically means by that is that the subjective dimension of who we are is central to how we understand politics. And that subjective dimension emerges within relations of power that bear down on culture in very direct, direct ways, whether we're talking about language, whether we're talking about entertainment industries, whether we're talking about the media. I mean, all of these industries work in such a way as to vie over some sort of struggle about what the world means. And I'll, I'll give you a very specific example of that. We live in a world, I think all of us now live in a world in which celebrity culture has an enormous amount of authority. Enormous amount of authority. Uh, when Donald Trump was in his first primary, the average audience was something like 20 million. With Trump just appearing in the first debate, I'm sorry, uh, the first presidential debate, it jumped to like 40 million because of the celebrity status that he has. And so we, we have to ask ourselves, how are resources being invested in a culture that either serves to make people ignorant 
or serves in a sense to convince them that the only thing that matters is, that, is the world of consumption, or a culture that in some way stretches the imagination to provide people with a sense of liter literacy and dignity that enables them to both shape that culture and to link that culture with questions of economic and social justice and with the, 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 the radical imagination, what it means to stretch the imagination. I mean, I, I don't think that culture is strictly political in the sense that it makes you a socialist or a fascist. I think that culture makes you become alive in terms of its wakefulness. I mean, culture is something that makes us awake. It, it, it opens up the world in a way in which, it, in some way, we, we're under, we understand the cultural forces that bear down on us, and we raise very specific questions about what, what it means to live in a society and what role that culture should play in that society, outside simply questions of reproduction, outside of questions of, of tyranny. I mean, what does it mean to talk about culture in an age of tyranny? How, how do you raise that? What does that question mean? What does it mean for education? What does it mean for colleges? What does it mean for public intellectuals? What does it mean for people working in a wide variety of professions? How do you want to talk about language here? You know, how do you want to talk about the way in which values are handed down and normalized? What does it mean when people say, well, the fascism can mean anything? Uh, you know, appropriating the language so as to su suggest that if it can mean anything, then it can be normalized easily. And then we don't have to think about the past. We don't have to think about history. We don't have to think about historical memory. So it, it, it seems to me that to talk about culture is to talk about the very fate of what it means to be human and what it means to be human in the sense that we acknowledge that we're unfinished, that we constantly have to be creative in understanding what it means for human beings to keep going, you know, to develop a sense of curiosity and to recognize at a social level that we all live in societies in which no society is ever just enough, never just enough. And that culture plays a crucial role in helping us to understand that and to address that, and to take into consideration what it means to live both as an individual and social agent. Mm -hmm. In your, I think it was again in your printed version of the talk, you talked about um, how necessary it was to awaken our critical, imaginative, and historical sensibility. And I think it's, that is clearly related to culture and to art somehow. So that also, um, is, is a good way to go into the first question from the audience. This is from Jose Maria Vilaplana y Marin, who is an arts manager. And then we also, we, we con connected this question with another from Antonio Galera Hernández, who is a musician, because those questions were clearly linked and so we had a single question for both of them. I hope they agree with our mix. And I read again. Every time something is wrong with society, Schools are held responsible for teaching whatever it is supposed to fix it. So if something is wrong, please schools teach, I don't know, um, emotional intelligence or non-violent emotional relationships and so on. As if all the responsibility fell on the side of schools. But shouldn't other social and cultural agencies, shouldn't other cultural or social agents be responsible too? Is everything falling on the side of school as responsibility? What happens then? Talking about culture, how culture is also responsible for this. And shouldn't, since you talked about culture as a, as a, as a, as a teaching, it could be a machine, but it can teach many things. So uh, culture is teaching things too. Shouldn't the curriculum be less burdened with technical or instrumental content so there's more time to learn about the human being, the society, and the arts? And if these humanistic areas are such a powerful tool for social change, why educational and political agencies do not seem to be interested? So how come that this is so important in order to change society? How come that maybe we should have more room for this, and how come that then political agencies are not interested in this, and actually they are disappearing from the curriculum, all these areas. They are more centered into right reading the three hours, the right reading and... Um, I mean, it's a double bind, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at one level, people say that schools are responsible for the problems that we have. They're not responsible, but in some way, yeah, are both responsible and need to address that issue. That's a politics of diversion. I mean, and it's a disingenuous argument. Because at the same time, if they believed that, then I would assume they would pump as, many, as much resources into schools as they possibly could and force governments to do that, to take seriously what is in fact an, a, an enormously exaggerated charge and claim. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, schools are simply one facet, a very important facet, but to say that schools are responsible for the decline of healthcare, or to say that schools are basically responsible for massive inequality. Six people own half the wealth of the, of the earth. Uh, actually is, is, a, is a kind of joke that belongs on Comedy Central. You know, that's a script for, com for comics. 
But I, but I think at another level, it, it's also a way of placing a burden on schools that allows people to say that they're failing, and therefore we should cut back on funds, and therefore we should exercise more discipline with teachers, and therefore we should impose more restraint. I always read that as a script to basically attack schools. I read it as a script to attack teachers. I read it as a script to defund schools. I mean, in the United States, we, we say public schools are failing. We, we never talk about how the, the, the federal government is constantly providing massive amounts of money for charter schools, or how the states are completely defunding schools. Of course they're failing. They're failing because they're being defunded. So it seems to me that you have at one level of politics of diversion, claiming that schools should assume all that responsibility. There are multiple agencies that should assume that responsibility. And there are multiple individuals and there are multiple political formations that should assume that responsibility. But the other issue is I think we need to understand the hidden curriculum here. And the hidden curriculum here is that if schools are responsible for everything, then of course that means that they're set up to fail. And if they're set up to fail, then Can you hear me? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Can you see the last sentence? Yeah. I, okay. I, and then the yeah. I, 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 yeah. I'll, 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 sorry. I'll, I'll repeat that. I think that people who claim that schools bear the burden of solving all the problems. Are you? Okay. Yeah. Schools that schools that bear the bear the burden of claiming that. I mean, I'm, yeah. When schools bear the blurred burden of the argument. Is it something? You know what? Is there something else? it off without noticing, maybe? Oh, there's another one. Okay. Try this one. Okay. Is it on? Just. Yeah. Is that better? No. Oh, uh, how's that? Uh, how's that? Is that okay? <laughs> Okay, I, I think that people who argue that, argue that schools bear the burden of solving all the problems in society basically set schools up to fail and then use that as a rationale to punish teachers and to basically defund schools and to support all kinds of rationales in which we claim that the politicians really know what's best for schools and not educators. So I, I never quite take that argument seriously. On a rational level, of course, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. I mean, as I said earlier, and I'm not sure if my mic was on, do we blame schools for massive inequality? Do we blame schools for the rise of fascism? I mean, do we blame schools for the fact that uh, NAFTA is all of a sudden uh, you know, creating armies and, of, of homeless people? Do we blame schools for what banks do in the financial crisis by falsifying mortgages and as a result producing hundreds of thousands of people who lose their homes? I don't think schools are responsible for that. I mean, I think it's very convenient to make that claim. Then we can divert the political arguments that need to be raised about who is responsible. That's an argument of political educational irresponsibility. Then the question was also about how to make room for other things. It's like people have, um, schools have to teach all kinds of things, right. but sometimes there's no room for other areas of knowledge that are more linked to the humanities and allow right. students to have a more reflective right. uh, approach to society. It's not so instrumental. Maybe moving to the next question allows us to discuss more, that more precisely. Sure. This, this is a question from Rosa Gamit Sanchez, who is an actress. And um, I, I, I wrote a little bit of context to the question so it is more clearly understood, because the question is basically what comes at the end. Is while humanistic and artistic subjects are disappearing from the curriculum, at the same time there is a growing interest in bringing arts and creativity to the schools in the form of external and often short-term collaborations with artists and arts organizations. You may be familiar with that too. So what is the role of artists in education? And wouldn't it be important to engage in long-term collaborations rather than short-term ones so the experience is more transformative in general and teachers can gain competence and be empowered in the field of arts themselves? So what is the role of arts in all this, in all these debates and these responsibilities? No, I, I think it's an absolutely fabulous question. And I think it goes to the heart of the failing of governments to understand the importance of the arts not only in education, but in civic life. You know, it, it, it seems to me that the issue is not whether in, in the, in, schools are increasingly defunded 
and curricula are turned over to these really deadening accountability schemes that, that these people sort of make up somewhere in Disneyland. Uh, it, it seems to me that the arts should be absolutely central to the curricula, and, and they should include not only artists who basically come in and work long term and have long term contracts, but they should be actively involved with the community in all forms of collaboration. So it's not either or, it's both. I mean, if you're really going to take the arts seriously, you know, then you've got to make it a fundamental part of the curriculum. There is no, there is so much research available, as anybody in education knows. The arts are so enriching, so productive for education, that it's a crime, it's criminogenic to exclude them. The, 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 the research is in on this. It's not a debate anymore. It enriches the career, and especially for working class kids, especially in poor neighborhoods, where kids are really plugged into popular culture and the arts. That's their language. That's their language. To not give them an opportunity to use that language and to have role models of people who basically are in the arts doing wonderful things, and also working with teachers to expand their possibilities pedagogically in terms of what they should do. I mean, it's one of the great crimes in the assault against education. It's one of the great crimes is, is the elimination of the arts or reducing the arts to some externality in which people meet an artist once a year you know, or maybe once every two months. Uh, it's a great question and it seems to me that any educational system that fails to incorporate that fails in general. It's also paradoxical because creativity has become such a buzzword in education. Everybody should be creative, but then the arts are nowhere to be seen. Let's take a very classic example. I mean, at the heart of my talk is the, is the notion, what should education do in a time of tyranny? In Chile, and in Brazil right now, uh, this fascist guy who's now the president of, of Chile has just been, he's claiming he's gonna ban sociology and philosophy from the curriculum. And that what he wants now in higher education is simply subjects that immediately translate into the logic of business, the logic of profit, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Think about this. I mean, that's the pedagogy of barbarians. Mm -hmm. And if there is anything on the side of, no, of the practice of freedom, it's the arts. That's why the, the intellectuals always, the artists always go first in fascist regimes. Yeah. Absolutely. But let's end with some hope. End with some hope. <laughs> so yeah, this is the final area of debate, is ed um, educating for hope. And then we start with a, a question from an anonymous person uh, who didn't want to give his or her name. And it's a very particular question. It uh, goes like this. Finland is considered to be a profoundly democratic and egalitarian country. And its educational system is taken as a model everywhere. Why is it then that a far-right-wing, uh, far-right party like True Finns did so well? Can you, Babe? Ah. Well, how come the True Finns won the, the last national election? And doesn't this drown hope a little bit when you see a country that is usually understood as a very democratic one, like with a social system that still stands, but still we have these far-right parties gaining over like the political debate. What's the paradox there? What's this, what happens with hope when we find this kind of... There are two issues here, right? One is, let's not define, edu let's not define schooling as the only form of education. Mm -hmm. Once you make that mistake, then you're assuming the way people learn in a particular society only comes from the schools, and if, they have, if they have, there's the rise of fascist politics, we don't look at the media, <laughs> we, don't, we don't look at the, 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 the way in which the, the, uh, the digi digital ecosystem has been taken over, we don't look at a whole range of in, in, uh, in questions that basically in which the cultural apparatuses become complicit. The other side of this is that whether or not, simply because Finland may have a more progressive educational system, does it really mean that the government in general is addressing social problems in ways that would take those problems seriously and, in a, in a way, counter the kind of fascist logic that's now uh, at work. The other side of this is that when everybody talks about the Finland's, fin the Finland's educational system, they don't talk about content. They talk about the fact that classes are small. They talk about the fact there are two teachers in, every, in some cases in every classroom, that teachers get higher benefits. 
But the real question here becomes, is that system linked to questions of pursuing economic and social justice? Mm -hmm. I mean, to what degree are, are kids really learning about democracy and really learning about what it means to, uh, to, to fight reactionary, orthodox, dominating logics? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a different kind of question, right? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, you know, outside of schools, the, the, that massive educational system that now, you know, is all part of screen culture, how is it functioning? Have they escaped from Google? I mean, have they escaped from Microsoft? Have they escaped from Facebook? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know in the United States, I mean, you know, th these companies are now pumping all kinds of technologies into curricula with, with, the, with the ongoing assumption that kids don't need to dialogue with teachers. You know, that basically that this is purely instrumental, that the logic is watered down, has nothing to do with questions of economic and social justice, and basically they really believe that education is about creating robots, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and what I call zombies. You know, there's a kind of zombie element to this culture mm -hmm. that we, we've got to direct head on. We're not talking about an internet that's on the side of simply democracy, right? And we're not talking about the fact that education now probably is far more powerful outside of schools than it is in schools. Mm -hmm. And how do you connect that with the rise of fascism there? I, mean, I, 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 think that the, I think that fascist fascist parties in many countries, including the United States, are enormously adept at using digital culture. Mm -hmm. Enormously adept. They're enormously adept at addressing needs that offer the false pretense of community. I think mean, they're, they're incredibly adept, adept at pitting people against each other as a way of basically addressing very important social problems that established politicians refuse to address. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it mean when somebody like Hillary Clinton, who I would have preferred vastly over <laughs> Donald Trump, that's for sure, but it makes a public, it's revealed that she makes a statement to Goldman Sachs in which she has a private language and a public language. That's not exactly a language, that, that's not exactly a point that working class people want to invest in, mm -hmm. right? So it seems to me if you don't address the conditions that allow people to move to the right, don't blame the educational system. Mm -hmm. Blame a political system that's defaulted on its own promises of what it means to live in a, in a, in a substantive democracy. Mm -hmm. well, that didn't sound very hopeful, but let's... <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me, let me, can I finish? Sure, one, one of course. Last, I'm sorry. I want to end. No, it was, the, I, I want to end on the, I, you, I wanna end on the, you. I want to end on the question of hope. Okay. Uh, I, I think there are three things to say about the language of critique and the language of possibility. Mm -hmm. I don't think that critique should exist without a language of possibility, first of all. Secondly, it seems to me that all too often, even people on the left seem to equate power simply with domination. And power is not simply about domination. It's also about resistance. It's also about collective struggle. Thirdly, I, I think we need to become aware of the fact that the, the struggles that are often taking place that are very powerful, are very important, um, speak to enormous possibilities for how the future should be defined and battled against, never make the established media. You know, what we hear about, we hear about the right, we hear about established politicians, but we don't hear about the Black Lives Movement. I mean, we don't hear about uh, women in, in the red states organizing for democratic socialism. And whenever those terms are even mentioned, they're always done pejoratively. You know, I mean, when we talk about Venezuela, we always refer to the leader of Venezuela as a dictator. We don't talk about a guy who's trying to usurp power in, in Venezuela as, as, as a, you know, a, a radical insurgent who basically is trying to overthrow the state. I mean, so language matters. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it seems to me that what we need to understand about the language of hope is that the language of hope is always beneath the surface. You know, it, it's never really on the surface in established societies, and we need to redeem it and bring it to the surface mm -hmm. and make it palpable and make it important and connect it with what I would call the desire for a better world. So let, uh, this is going to be the final question before we go to the move to, I think we still have some time for open questions. Okay, the final one is about the conditions for this hope and this possibility. Um, that is something that concerns, we've been thinking about about it because it's something that is very present in our political lives. It's about um, how to create solidarity among different groups and communities um, because it is difficult in an area of these reinforced identities and inequalities and sometimes inequality is formulated in the debate in terms of identity. So we have this struggle of identities that suffer different ways of oppression. So how do we... So we have to understand that race and gender and class and ability and et cetera weave in complex dynamics 
of, uh, of privilege and exclusion. So how can we build alliances and relations of solidarity among groups without ignoring the existing conditions of inequality, privilege, and exclusion? And that, for example, has been very visible in the feminist movement when we try to, to create alliances with, um, with uh, women of African descent. And it has been very difficult because we, are, we come from this uh, European feminism based on privilege as white women. So how do we build alliances to create I this new? Issues, yeah. I, mean, I, Great. I, I think there are three. I mean, I think that at one level, we need to be grateful for the fact that what, what a, a, a viable politics of identity does is it expands and makes us aware of forms of oppression that we often haven't been aware of in the past, whether we're talking about gay rights or we're talking about a whole range of things. And that has to be applauded. Um, secondly, it, it, it seems to me th the question that becomes crucial if you really believe that the only way we can address a system that is enormously powerful in its ability to oppress people is by developing what I would call a comprehensive politics of the totality, understanding how it works in its totality. And I think that if we're going to in some way get beyond the fragmentation that sometimes comes with identity politics and sometimes massive exclusions. Uh, that are linked to essentialist notions of what politics might be. We have to understand the threads that run through these various forms of oppression that in fact connect them. And connect them in a way that both affirm the oppressions in their specificity, but also recognize the limits of what that might mean in developing a comprehensive political social formation in which these various groups can come together and be able to form a third party or be able to form a political formation that represents a massive social movement. And I, and I think in some, in some cases, uh, we, we have to begin to link these questions of identity with, with questions of economic deprivation and connect them to people's lives in ways that uh, people can both recognize the forms of identity that, that, that people are arguing in their specific ways, but also the very forms of suffering and, and lack of privilege. You know, it's, it's very difficult to talk to working class white males who, who don't have a job and to say, you're white and therefore you're privileged. Right? I mean, privilege comes in many forms, right? And, and in some cases, when you're battling just to survive, that the notion that privilege is something you should be ashamed of seems to operate more as less as a politics of enlightenment than as a pedagogy of shaming. And the real issue is to sort of connect the very conditions in which they find themselves with a the notion of white privilege that reproduces a system that they have to, in a sense, overthrow or get rid of. So that that question of privilege now is eliminated across the board for all kinds of groups who really benefit from that privilege in very powerful ways, not in very abstract minor ways. Uh, fourthly, it, it, it seems to me that I don't understand what it means to talk about a politics that doesn't have a signifier that begins to link these various groups together. I don't care if you want to talk about that movement as something that's a, a movement for radical democracy, for democratic socialism, uh, but we need a larger umbrella. You know, one that both affirms those identities, recognizes their limits, and is possible to bring people together. For instance, you can't believe in a radical democracy or a socialist democracy if you're a racist, right? I mean, I mean, how can you believe in the ideals of a socialist democracy if you're a misogynist? How can you believe, you know, you can, you, can, you, can, you can argue that I really believe in ecological change, that we have to change the, but, but you know, I, I, I kind of like being a racist at the same time. So it seems to me that these are very complex issues that we have to begin to mediate so we understand what the limits of those notions of identity, their strengths, and at the same time, the absolute need to overcome the fragmentation. Fragmentation kills because it withers the possibility for a, a comprehensive analysis. I mean, when we look at, at fascism in the 1930s and the 40s, and we look at the Frankfurt School and those critical theorists, those really massively intelligent individuals who came, Rosa Luxemburg, I mean, even before that, then Adorno and Horkheimer, they understood one thing. You had to understand that system in its totality. You had to understand the connections. I don't know what it means to talk about domination if you don't understand history. I don't know what it means if you can't connect the dots. You know, you can't, for instance, to give you an example, people say schools are failing. How, what does that mean if you can't talk about neoliberalism and massive inequality? Does it make sense? Fair enough, right? I mean, wh how do you talk about Trump as a racist if you can't talk about the history of racism in the United States? Or if you can't talk about the rise of the punishing state and the rise of the carceral state? These are all connected issues. 
And unfortunately, it seems to me we're more we seem more intent sometimes on identifying very specific elements in that chain of equivalencies of oppression than we do in bringing them together and understanding how they work to reinforce each other. Thank you. Well, I think that hope is there, but it's not going to be easy. But of course not. So now we have some time for questions from the floor. Si teniu alguna pregunta, tenim uns minuts, que era la idea. Els hem pogut preservar una mica justos, però sí que els tenim i val la pena aprofitar si creieu que hi ha alguna qüestió que no s'ha tractat. I mentre van fluint les idees i circulen els micros, faig un moment una pregunta a Giro. No sé si ha estat un error, però a principi del seu de la seva exposició m'ha semblat que deia que hi havia com una mena de crisi global a nivell de les democràcies, però he sentit la paraula, excepte Espanya. I si ha estat un error de traducció o li hem d'explicar el que està passant aquí? Jo crec que sí, que tots hem fet així, no? No, 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 I, 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 I certainly did not suggest uh, in any fundamental way at all that uh, uh, Spain has reached the aperture of democracy. <laughs> no, I, I think that what I was suggesting was that we have seen a slight turn in Spain in the elections that curb in some way the rise of neo fascism that offers a slight, a very slight bulwark against the rise of neo-fascist movements elsewhere. I mean, it, there is one phrase that I particularly liked by Sanchez, but I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, that's not the political person I would support. But I, but I think that the notion that uh, the, 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 the future has won and the past is lost, uh, to me is an interesting concept that exceeds maybe what he knew he was talking about. And I, I think that phrases like that come back to haunt you because we have to be very careful how, in the name of democracy, we, don't, we forget about the past and what, in fact, we begin to reintroduce uh, elements that create the very problems that created the horrors of the past. So it seems to me, I, I read that moment, this moment in Spain's history as an opportunity to really understand what it means to talk about the future seriously in real political terms, around real substantial questions of economic and political justice, and not just some centrist liberal party, you know, that, that basically uh, never goes far enough as far as I'm concerned, you know. I mean, I, no, I won't say this. I'll, 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 I, I'm not in a position to go much further. But thank you for the, thank you for the question. <laughs> faig en català i em tradueixes, que ho fas molt bé tu. I que la faig en català i em tradueixes. Ha parlat de la necessitat d'un paraigües global que ens permeti afrontar els reptes que ens uneixen en aquesta diversitat. Sé que quan es fa referència als drets humans sovint es critica, que és una declaració occidental amb moltes problemàtiques, però m'agradaria preguntar-li no tenim altra cosa en aquests moments com a paraigües global que no siguin els drets humans. Què en pensa? Què en pensa d'això? Amb la darrera pregunta, vas parlar de aquestes umbrella nocions o estrelles que poden connectar diferents grups, així que no hi ha una fragmentació. I llavors ella està preguntant que, encara que ha estat criticitzada molt, els drets humans seems to be like the human rights with, with capital human rights, rights. Yeah. the human rights are like the only thing that we have in common although she understands that is in terms of western hegemony deeply problematic so what do you think about that is human rights an umbrella enough in, that is useful in this case or should yeah. we move towards other notions beyond yeah. human rights 
comments? I, I, yeah, it, it's, it's a wonderful question. Uh, thank you for that. I, 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 I think there were two things to say about that question. I mean, I think that at one level, we need to understand how human rights is sometimes a cover, a, a really dreadful cover for the worst forms of oppression. Um, dominant societies always like to believe that they're exceptional and therefore, in the name of human rights, actually produce the opposite. Uh, for me, I, I would like to deconstruct that term in ways that suggest the merging of three categories, uh, political rights, individual rights, and social rights. Because it seems to me, if you're going to talk about rights, political rights and individual rights tend to become meaningless unless we have economic rights meaning that unless we provide social rights in which people have the right to eat, have the right to decent housing, have the right to live, you know, have the right to exercise some kind of agency, then that notion of human rights becomes utterly problematic for me. And if you're going to talk about those three rights mutually informing each other, how can you be, what does political rights mean when you're starving? What, is it, what do individual rights mean? When, when you have massive inequality in a society. And so it seems to me that we need to formulate in relation to the question of human rights what it means to be a political and collective agent. How do we connect questions of agency with the question of human rights? And how do we connect agency, uh, human rights with the question of autonomy? How do we do that? How do we begin to talk about that in ways that can bypass and examine very carefully the, the reach of, 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 for instance, the power of the United States? to appropriate that language uh, uh, you know, in the name of NATO, you know, or in the name of thousands of military bases all over the world, or in the name of invasions uh, of various countries, and to actually claim this is, a, I mean, when you listen to a guy like Mark, M Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State of the United States, you want to shoot yourself. I mean, because it's, it's, it's in, in some ways such an attack on any substantive notion of human rights that the term almost becomes meaningless, except for the way it's used in a major hegemonic way. The other side of this is that we can't associate the drive for a comprehensive notion of human rights with simply uh, private charities. You know, we, we can't say that, you know, this, this is, this is the, an obligation of people in private industries or private charities or NGOs or private groups. This is a political question on a global level, and it has to be taken up by governments dedicated to questions of economic and social justice. Hola, bona tarda. Bueno, la meva pregunta és fent una reflexió al que comentava ella a la seva primera exposició, que durava 20-25 minuts, i en les seves frases hi havia dos conceptes que apareixien molt sovint. Capitalisme, feixisme, feixisme, capitalisme. Clar, els intel·lectuals, sobretot marxistes dels anys 20-30, feien una vinculació estreta amb aquests dos termes, perquè el feixisme ho entenien com una expressió més del capitalisme, sobretot amb el concepte imperialista. Vull entendre que ell d'alguna manera ho vincula. I si realment aquest element de resistència ha de ser eficaç, si des del punt de vista pedagògic seria molt interessant explicar què és el capitalisme i si realment el feixisme és una expressió del capitalisme. Per tant, potser seria dient explicar a la gent no pas la conseqüència, és a dir, el feixisme, sinó l'origen, el capitalisme. Aleshores seria un element, un context que tothom entendria i saber la naturalesa del capitalisme, l'evolució i si realment el que actualment els dogmàtics diuen que és capitalisme ha deixat de ser capitalisme i és neoliberalisme, etcètera, etcètera. Perdona? Per assegurar-me que ho traduiré bé, Entenc que el que estàs plantejant és que, a banda del background aquest històric, que també li traduiré, és si no seria interessant incloure en el... O sigui, si ell personalment, per exemple, perquè en la seva exposició apareixien les paraules... Sí, 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 això ho he entès. Si ell entén que el feixisme és una conseqüència del capitalisme, i si per tant si és així si per dur a terme aquesta resistència al neoliberalisme al segle XXI, etcètera, seria molt interessant explicar que el feixisme és una conseqüència 
i explicar, per una altra banda, des d'un punt de vista de context general, què és el capitalisme. Això les escoles entenen, els contextos educatius. No, no, en general. En general. És a dir, per exemple, aquesta reflexió que faig ara jo de vincular el feixisme amb el capitalisme, si és una cosa que la gent estaria actualment disposada a acceptar. D'acord. I think that's an, an incredibly important question, um, and it's not one I explored in the talk, but it's one that I explore a lot in at least my last three books. Um, I, I think actually capitalism in the present moment in its extreme form of what we might call neoliberal global capitalism is far more powerful than anything we have seen in the past. The misery that it produces is much greater and I think at the same time its ability to normalize itself and make it appear as if it's the only ideology that's acceptable is more powerful than at any time we have seen in the past because in the past the, country, the, the economic crisis was matched in a sense by a crisis of ideas. Today the economic crisis is not matched by a crisis of ideas. And it seems to me it's precisely at that moment in the inability to translate the link between the conditions that neoliberal capitalism is producing all over the world in advanced and in non-advanced allegedly countries, that link is not being made. So we talk about fascism as simply something on the margins. We talk about fascism as simply something coming out of nowhere. We talk about it as simply, a, how do you say it, uh, um, uh, it's so exceptional that it has to be separated and uh, moved away from the current society in which we find ourselves. And I'll give you the best example, at least, forgive me if I have to resort to the United States, but people often talk about Trump as being eccentric. They talk about him as being uh, psychologically unstable. They talk about him as being an entertainer who just happened to win the American presidency. And, and he's come to symbolize a very, two very central elements of fascism, right? Ultra-nationalism and, and, white, and uh, racial superiority, white nationalism. Trump is a sim symptom of a system that's been growing since the 1980s. Whether you want to talk about you want to talk about NAFTA, you want to talk about the eradication of social goods, the rise of the punishing state, the replacement of a market economy by a market society, the massive inequality, the enormous suffering, the increase in the militarization of everyday life, the masculinization of the public sphere, these are all fascist elements. And Trump is simply a symptom, just as we have to say that fascism today in many ways is a symptom of the large, the great disorder, the, the disimagination machines, the landscapes of human suffering that have been, been created and matched by an ideology that is so all-encompassing, so powerful, that we don't seem to have a set of ideals in any one place anymore that can counter that. So you have the economic crisis matched by, not matched by a crisis of ideas, and you have a notion of hegemony a notion of normalization, I love the word normaliz normalization, that is far more powerful, I think, than anything we saw in the 30s and 40s. Far more powerful, and far more deadly, far more poisonous, and far more toxic, and far more difficult to defeat. Thank you. I think that that's the time we have, yeah, because we have to leave the premises. And, but thank you very much for engaging in this conversation. It's very generous of you, and we have enjoyed it very much. Thank you.